Welcome back to the blog. Uh, glad to have you back. Doing another uh, post in my ongoing series of uh, Through the Book of Genesis concerning prayer. Today I want to look at Genesis 3 and talk about prayer as confession. So I'll start off with a little quote from one of my favorites, Eugene Peterson, in his book, Tell It Slant. Near the end, he writes the following. He says, we learn the language of prayer by immersing ourselves in the language that God uses to reveal himself to us, the Jesus language world. We pray in the context of Jesus at prayer. Our prayers are no longer shaped by culture. We are well warned against religious snake language. Our prayers are rescued from being conditioned by our psyche. We acquire a prayer language adequate for listening and speaking in the large world of the Trinity revealed in Jesus by the Father through the Spirit. Prayer is personal speech, father and son speech, God and daughter speech. It is language put to the uses of relationship. It is conversation. God listens to us. We listen to God. God speaks to us. We speak to God. It would be too much to say that this is a conversation between equals, but at least both parties are speaking the same language a language of revelation, a deeply relational language, not an informational language, not a manipulative language. In all the books that I have read um, regarding uh, theology, the Bible, uh, exegetical methods, homiletics, whatever, I have not read very much at all regarding the Christian uh, practice of confession. Uh, one of the things I like about the church that I belong to now is that we practice a a, uh, a communal, a group confession. Uh, nearly, I think we do it just about every Sunday. Um, you know, sometimes it depends on the liturgy, but um, for the most part, uh, you know, we do this every week. Um, maybe I've read a chapter or two here and there, uh, you know, where the author is dealing with, uh, you know, something uh, in the Lord's Prayer, Matthew 6 or something like that. But even those are few and far between. We just don't read a lot about the practice of confession. Maybe if you listen and you've got some resources, you could, uh, you know, put them in the comments or whatever. But Peterson's point, uh, it seems, underscores the main point of the series that I'm working on, you know, in Genesis, that prayer is conversation. It is conversation within the family. Our Father is how we typically begin such conversations. It's back and forth. Although I confess that my prayers are are often very one-sided, with me doing far more of the talking than, than the listening. But I think it is safe to say that if prayer is conversation, and I believe that Genesis is kind of leaning this way, then there should be more than one voice involved in the talk. I'm one voice, the Father is another voice. Um, and, and it's important. I, I mean, I know God doesn't have a problem listening to us, I think most of the time the problem comes in, you know, that we have problems listening to God and we're, we're just not the kind of people that we're dare going to tell people out loud, well, God said this to me because then people think we're freaks and weirdos and they think that we're freaks and weirdos anyway. So, but Genesis three, it's a, it's a complicated chapter. There's, there's little doubt about that. Um, I've spent a lot of time, you know, reading through Genesis three, uh, talking about it, preaching on it. One of the first sermons I ever preached, maybe my sophomore year in Bible college, was based on Genesis three, and I remember trying to, uh, you know, uh, I was trying to really score some points with the professor, and so um, I, I dropped a Gerhard von Rad quote. Uh, I think it made for good conversation after the sermon during the critique time, but. I don't think that it helped my grade any as far as it goes. So even so, Genesis 3 just happens to, you know, the, I just think the chapter happens so quickly It's that it's it's just stunning. It, it kind of makes the head spin. I mean, things are good, 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 very good. There's a garden. There's, you know, creation. There's naming animal life. And then all of a sudden, boom, one of those animals comes in, crafty serpent, another Simply another beast of the field made by the Lord appears and fantastically talks. Those of us who have grown up on Looney Tunes were not too shocked by talking snakes, but 
Others have used it as an occasion to be snarky and mean and condescending. But nevertheless, here he is. There is Eve. And Adam is there too. Yes, Adam is there too. He just doesn't talk as much until the Lord uh, breezes into town. But really from there, it's all it's all downhill. Um, you know, the rest, frankly, the rest of the Bible, uh, it's just, it's, you know, when you get down to the end of it, I mean, it just really, the whole story just kind of gets wrecked in Genesis 3. Um, you know, but, you know, think about God. He doesn't, you know, come in. He doesn't accuse. He questions them. Uh, and, and then Adam lets the cat out of the bag, so to speak, by going on about being naked and hiding. And then God says, well, wait a minute. Who who, who told you that you're naked? Hey, wait, did you eat from that tree that I told you not to eat from? Don't you hate it when you ask a specific question and people give you an answer to the question that doesn't have anything to do with the question you ask? So, well, uh, the woman that you gave to be with me, uh, yeah, yeah, she gave me some of the fruit and I ate it. And then God looks at Eve and says the same thing. And the serpent, or Eve, then responds, Oh, uh, it was a serpent. He deceived me and I ate. It's kind of like they're trying to hide that. Yes, I ate part, you know, by putting all those caveats in front of it. Um, you know, the serpent doesn't get asked who he's going to blame. <laughs> uh, well, because frankly, who is he going to blame? I don't want to dwell here. I'm going to have to break this into two parts anyway, because it's kind of long, but I, I do want to get this first part in. So, I don't want to dwell here on on the on the rest of the story. Just, um, uh, you know, re, read that story and, and get familiar with it. But the story, it, it's not that I think it's so straightforward because I think there's a lot of nuances and turns in there. But I really want to stay focused on prayer as confession. So I want to just draw out a couple points here. I think uh, three points, but probably only going to get one in the first part of this video. So, But the first thing I notice is this. The first thing I notice is that this is conversation that is initiated by God. And and I think it has to be, don't you? I mean, it's not like Adam and Eve were going out of their way to seek the Lord after they ate. You know, it's like, hey, Adam, hey, Eve, let's, yeah, let's uh, let's run and tell the Lord what we did. Well, they, they don't do that. We're given no indication that, that these people were willing to own up to their sin or that they were trying to find him. We're simply no different. Confession just doesn't always sit right at the top of our list of priorities after we've spent a few hours downing Twinkies or tequila. God always starts that conversation with us. You know, the, the, the Holy Spirit, you know, prompting us, um, you know, kind of unnerving us, you know, hunting us down. You can call it guilt. You can call it whatever. But there it is, you know, and we either choose to ignore or we choose to answer. But I think there's a couple things more we can say about this. And seeking them out, I think God lets them know a couple of things. First, you know, they they cannot escape his watchful eyes. Uh, he's, you know, where can I go? You know, if I go here, you're there. If I go there, you're, you're there. Um, there's nowhere I can go where God can't find me. Second, I don't think God wants them to avoid this conversation. It's probably true that we do want to avoid this conversation with God, but God's appearance in the garden that day forces their confession. You know, did you? Yes. I mean, they really, they didn't have any other choice but to, you know, admit what they had done. God already knew. And third, I think that it clearly makes the point that making this, conf uh, that in making this confession, having it out in the open, I think is central to restoring the relationship with God that they broke by eating from the tree. He makes the relationship right again in a number of ways. I'm not going to dwell on that, but all the initiative belongs to the Lord. But I think it's very clear that there had to be some sort of admission, some sort of confession on the part of Adam and Eve. Come back for part two, uh, and I'll give you all the rest of uh, my thoughts. Thanks.